Hello and welcome. On behalf of IAS, the International AIDS Society, I warmly welcome you all here in Berlin to the IAS 2021, the 11th IAS Conference on HIV Science. I'm honored to be a master of ceremonies for the next four days. My name is Eckhard von Hirschhausen. I'm a physician, I'm a science journalist, and I'm the founder of Healthy Planet, Healthy People Foundation. Ich bin ein Berliner. <laughs> I know I'm not the first person after JFK saying this, but in my case it's true. Berlin ist eine Reise wert. Berlin is worth the trouble, we say. But today we are gathered here at the world's most influential conference on HIV science. And although we cannot all be together in person in Berlin, we can look forward to an exciting program featuring highly diverse and cutting-edge critical advances in basic, clinical and operational HIV research. This year, we mark 40 years since AIDS was first reported. Four decades on, the HIV pandemic is very much still with us today, and the world is now in the midst of another pandemic, COVID-19, and mounting global pressing issues such as climate change. The message is clear. Following the science has never been more important. This is where IAS 2021 focuses its spotlight. We will probe the crucial issues facing HIV today and address the scientific gaps that remain. So wherever you are and however you are watching this opening session, thank you for joining us at AIS 2021. And as they say in German, <laughs> toi toi toi, which translates to let's have a great conference. In this opening session, we can look forward to a special welcome from German Chancellor Angela Merkel a lively panel discussion on the theme of pandemic to pandemic, you will be sure to be impressed by the lineup of panelists. But first, please welcome to the virtual stage the conference co-chairs, IAS President Adiba Kamarulsemann and Professor of HIV Research at the University of Bonn in Germany, Hendrik Streeck. Over to you. Welcome to IAS 2021, the 11th IAS conference on HIV science. It's been 40 years since the first reported cases of the disease now called AIDS, one of the worst pandemics in human history. To date, we have lost nearly 35 million people to AIDS. It is my honor to serve as president of IAS, the International AIDS Society, during this milestone anniversary as we reflect on this devastating toll. No one knows the cruel legacy of AIDS better than our community, the scientists, health providers, advocates, and populations most affected. We've also had a frontline view of the progress made of the past 40 years as incrementally at times, science has shed light on HIV and AIDS. Thanks to scientific inquiry, including the dogged determination of many IS members, a positive HIV test no longer means a death sentence. A mother living with HIV can give birth without passing it on to her child. And an undetectable viral load is untransmittable between partners. Each year, our treatment and prevention efforts improve. And each year, we continue to unlock the mysteries of how HIV interacts with the human body. Of course, this is the first virtual convening of the IAS Conference on HIV Science as another pandemic prevents many of us from convening in person to share the latest breakthroughs in science, medicine, health policy, and program implementation. The response to the COVID-19 pandemic has leveraged HIV science to advance with unprecedented speed. In barely a year, we have not one, but several strong vaccines. It has also reminded us that science is deeply political and just as evidence can drive sound policy, the politicization of science can drive misinformation and ultimately distrust. Our message to you is to follow the science. Just as 40 years of HIV experience informed the COVID-19 response, the scientific breakthroughs and political will achieved in that response must now propel our efforts to end HIV. We have new opportunities to adapt and enhance COVID-19 approaches and sustain global attention and commitment to prioritizing public health. 
This includes harnessing digital technology and community partnerships in research and healthcare delivery. Despite the challenges of COVID-19 lockdowns, curfews and supply disruptions, we have planned a robust scientific program. For my co-chair from Germany, Hendrik Strick and I, a huge thank you to the Scientific Programme Committee for volunteering their time to curate the conference programme. You have transcended the challenges of an unprecedented year and we cannot wait to dig into the studies you have selected. I am pleased now to declare that IAS 2021, the 11th IAS Conference on HIV Science, is officially open. Please welcome to the virtual stage my co-chair, Henrik Streeck, to deliver his opening remarks. Hallo und herzlich willkommen aus Berlin. It's my great pleasure to welcome you from Berlin to IAS 2021, the 11th IAS Conference on HIV Science. Some will join us in person at the Berlin Hub this week, but most of you are joining us virtually as the COVID-19 pandemic still poses a significant challenge for all of us, particularly those living with HIV. We do not know yet the precise impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on HIV and AIDS. But what we already know is nothing but alarming. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated many inequalities worldwide. UNAIDS programs and activities of joint partners were interrupted or could not be implemented despite all efforts and best intentions. HIV infections have gone undetected. Life-saving drugs have not been distributed. Why the COVID-19 pandemic is a devastating catastrophe for so many, so are the collateral damages in health, economic and social inequalities that put many in precarious situations. The political will and scientific effort have been enormous to end the COVID-19 pandemic. As Adiba just noted, we had eight licensed vaccines and over 30 clinical trials in phase three within months. Yet in the year we are celebrating the tragic anniversary of the first diagnosed cases of HIV and AIDS. But only 80 HIV vaccines have entered phase three, even though we are 40 years into the pandemic. While HIV cannot be compared to SARS-CoV-2 in structure and complexity, one point is clear. With political will, we can achieve more in the fight against HIV and AIDS. HIV is still a global problem. While we are hopeful on our way to end the pandemic, the other has endured far too long. The time is now to end HIV and AIDS. We have the means and we have the opportunity. Berlin would have been proud to host all of you at the IAS 2021 in our wonderful city. It was not meant to be during this pandemic, but Germany's deep commitment to end the HIV pandemic stands firm. And that commitment extends to the highest level of government. Chancellor Dr. Angela Merkel whom I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing, has prioritized public health in Germany and globally. As a scientist herself, she has made evidence-based policy a central pillar of her approach. Under her leadership, Germany has championed international cooperation, pushing European and other donor countries to increase their commitments and secure billions to fight the spread of HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis worldwide. Chancellor, thank you for joining us today. Sehr geehrte Frau Kamarul Zaman, sehr geehrter Herr Professor Streeck, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, nicht erst mit der Coronavirus-Pandemie wissen wir, dass Infektionskrankheiten keine Grenzen kennen. Das gilt seit Jahrzehnten leider auch für AIDS. Infektionskrankheiten stellen die Welt vor globale Herausforderungen. Deshalb ist auch ihre Bekämpfung nur über eine weltweite Zusammenarbeit denkbar. Und diese Zusammenarbeit gelingt nur durch einen offenen und stetigen Austausch von Wissenschaft und Forschung. In der Coronavirus-Pandemie erleben wir, 
wie dank internationaler Zusammenarbeit in Rekordzeit mehrere wirksame Impfstoffe entwickelt wurden. Gleichzeitig jedoch müssen wir feststellen, dass im Schatten der Pandemie Erfolge bei der Bekämpfung von HIV wieder eingebüßt wurden und sexuelle Gewalt zunahm, die auch zu einer Erhöhung der HIV-Infektionsrate geführt hat. Wir müssen diese mittelfristigen Folgen der Pandemie im Blick behalten. Aids darf durch die Coronavirus-Pandemie nicht in den Hintergrund rücken. Vielmehr muss die Weltgemeinschaft ihre Bemühungen verstärken, die HIV-bezogenen globalen Nachhaltigkeitsziele zu erreichen. Denn auch bei der weiteren Bekämpfung von Aids werden wir nur mit globaler Zusammenarbeit erfolgreich sein. Die Staaten dieser Erde können und müssen voneinander lernen. Vor diesem Hintergrund lässt sich ermessen, wie bedeutsam die International AIDS Society Conference on HIV Science ist, die den so wichtigen Austausch zwischen Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern aus aller Welt fördert und damit einen bedeutsamen Beitrag zum Kampf gegen HIV und AIDS leistet. Der Wissenschafts- und Forschungsstandort Deutschland steht als Partner bereit, um gemeinsam weitere Erfolge bei der Bekämpfung von AIDS und anderen Infektionskrankheiten zu erzielen. Ich wünsche Ihnen und Ihrer Konferenz viele gewinnbringende Anregungen. Herzlichen Dank Ihnen allen, die Sie mit Ihrer Expertise zum Gelingen dieser Konferenz beitragen. Welcome to our panel discussion from pandemic to pandemic. An esteemed panel of experts joins us today for this discussion. But before I introduce the panelists, allow me to set the scene. My name is Eckhard von Hirschhausen. I'm a medical doctor. I work on German public television, and I'm the founder of Healthy Planet, Healthy People Foundation. Over almost 18 months now, the world has faced an unprecedented, <laughs> unprecedented emergency, the most lethal pandemic since AIDS emerged 40 years ago. COVID-19 has swept the globe, bringing immense challenges, including for the tens of millions of people living with or affected by HIV. We are truly witnessing a tale of two pandemics, with HIV, the often forgotten pandemic in this story. There can be no doubt that COVID-19 has captured attention and diverted political interest, funding, expertise, and healthcare services away from HIV. COVID-19 has also exposed the inadequacy of investments in public health, the persistence of profound economic and social inequalities, and the fragility of many key global systems and approaches. The COVID-19 pandemic has benefited, on the other hand, from four decades of experience of HIV, as witnessed by the rapid development of vaccines. But COVID-19 has also opened doors to new possibilities for HIV science and service delivery. There are clearly many lessons to be learned on both sides. This panel will discuss how we can seize the moment to learn, leverage, and build a new way forward to the, for the benefit of everyone, everywhere. Joining me for this timely discussion are Minister Jens Spahn, German Federal Minister of Health, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the US NHA. Mrs. Yvette Raphael from South Africa, who has been living with HIV for 20 years and is the current Executive Director of Advocates for Prevention of HIV. Dr. Swami Samanathan, a pediatrician from India and now joining us from Geneva, where she is the first chief scientist at the WHO. Dr. Anthony Fauci, to start with, is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, of, and he has been advising uh, now seven presidents, starting from Ronald Reagan. Well, he oversees an extensive research portfolio devoted to preventing, diagnosing, and treating infectious and immune-mediated diseases. Dr. Fauci will frame the scientific perspective on both pandemics and explore how we can prevent COVID-19 from undermining decades of progress in tackling HIV and AIDS. Mr. Fauci, how has 40 years following the science in HIV benefited the response to COVID-19? Well, I believe that the science that has been invested in HIV has dramatically benefited our response to COVID-19. And I'll give you one very cogent example of that. The work that has put into, at this point, albeit as yet unsuccessful in developing a successful HIV vaccine, 
has really opened the door to a spectacularly successful set of COVID-19 vaccines. And the example in question is the structural biological approach of using structure-based vaccine design that has been going on for years with HIV to get the right confirmation of the envelope trimer that would engage the B cell repertoire to make broadly neutralizing antibodies. Although that has yet to this point been unsuccessful with HIV, the same investigators who had worked for years trying to develop an HIV vaccine used those technologies of structure-based vaccine design to get the precise prefusion confirmation of the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which now we know has been extraordinarily successful in the development of COVID-19 vaccines. So this is a very clear-cut example of decades of investment in research in HIV has played a major role in the success of the development of COVID-19 vaccines. And how can we now prevent COVID-19 from undermining decades of progress in HIV and AIDS? Well, I think we need to keep at the forefront of our minds something that you said in the very beginning in your introduction, that we are dealing with concomitant pandemics. The fact that we have a COVID-19 pandemic does not at all lessen the importance and the devastation associated with an HIV pandemic. And we really need to keep our, <clears throat> our eye on the ball and remember that despite the fact that we had put in billions and billions of dollars of investment in research and public health, that some of that can actually be applied indirectly to HIV. So it's just a matter of making sure we don't lose sight of the importance of HIV. If you look at the numbers of the devastation in death and, mor and morbidity, it's been extended over 40 years, but it has been substantial. I mean, you're talking about two of the most historic pandemics in the history of our civilization. We cannot forget it just because we happen to be in the middle of a historic pandemic with COVID-19. Thank you very much. Over to South Africa. Yvette is a consummate leader in the fight against HIV. She's been living with HIV for 20 years now, experiencing firsthand what HIV stigma, insufficient prevention education, and reduced access to healthcare can do. She used her natural leadership abilities to co-found organizations in South Africa that deal with HIV and prevention. Yvette is the current executive director of Advocates for the Prevention of HIV and newly appointed board member of MTV Staying Alive. As a woman living with HIV for 20 years, you have experienced firsthand how HIV stigma can reduce um, uh, and impact communities. From your personal experience, how has COVID-19 impacted access to treatment services for people living with HIV like you? Please, Yvette. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me try and reintroduce myself. I'm a 47-year-old. Uh, from South Africa, based in Johannesburg, but I'm also originally from a very small community in the northern parts of South Africa in Limpopo. Where I come from is important because never did I, uh, did I imagine I would be infected with HIV. Never did I imagine I would be, as we speak today, recovering only a few days from a COVID infection, very, very sick. Never did I think I would be at the center of fighting for the rights of people living with HIV, fight for access of HIV treatment, or even be in the forefront of fighting for research and development agenda, in particular research targeting young women in my country and continent. I'm intentionally using the word fight because that is how I get my government to respond and to act. My journey started when I was diagnosed with HIV in the midst of HIV denialism lack of particularly presidential and, of course, political uh, leadership at the time. At the time, I carried three burdens, being black, being poor, and being a woman. And I soon, soon learned that this burden would follow me as long as I live. Sadly, the burden is still continuing, and it carried most, and is carried by most of women 
and young girls. My involvement in HIV in the HIV struggle started due to me experiencing stigma myself of having tested HIV positive. This followed by me working in my own communities hands-on. And then when scientists were coming in and out of our country and continent doing research, did I soon realize that these issues affected me personally because I see faces when Dr. Fauci and other scientists see statistics. I saw governments see statistics where I know our stories matter. Our own stories matter, that our only, own lived experiences were our data, and that was important. Like TB is the poor cousin of HIV, COVID is the rich aunties last born, and we all can relate to what that means. Many countries and governments raised and spent billions of dollars on the COVID response funds. Resources were diverted from HIV and TB to the, co uh, the COVID emergency response. In turn, many countries looted and widespread corruption occurred. This is also not, was also not unforeseen by many of us activists and leaders in the fight against HIV. We saw it coming. We knew it would happen. When lockdown started, we wanted to hear during these lockdowns, what are the plans from our countries, our leaders, our departments of health for access of HIV medication and as well as PrEP and treatment and what will follow, what will happen to our follow-up visits? We all had these questions. We even wrote personal open letters to African leaders, but this fell on deaf ears. When research showed evidence of defaulting increased infection in HIV and TB, we were not surprised at all, just like we were not surprised at the vaccine access in, and inequality. We loved it, we experienced it. The biggest mistake was not proactively engage the HIV sector globally and make communities lead, community leaders part of the COVID response. Thank you, Yvette, so far. Now over to Dr. Swaminathan to speak about how we can apply lessons learned from HIV to address inequalities in the COVID-19 response. Dr. Swaminathan was appointed a WHO first chief scientist in March 2019. A pediatrician from India, she is globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. She has more than 30 years of experience in clinical care and research and has worked throughout her career to translate research into impactful programs. The HIV response has been successful when people living with and affected by HIV are actively engaged and supported in their efforts to address the pandemic. What can we learn from this finding for the future? What is the role of prevention? And how can we engage political leaders to make health a priority, please? Thank you so much uh, for those questions. And I think I would like to underline what you just said about the HIV response being successful when people living with and affected by HIV, and we've just heard from Yvette, how when they are actively engaged and supported, the, the pandemic could, ad could be addressed. And going back to the days when antiretroviral treatment was not available for many, many people in Africa, uh, it was the activists in, based in mainly South Africa, but also around the world in the United States and other countries who fought for access to treatment. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are sort of seeing a repeat of, um, of the same story that we saw with HIV medicines. And this time we're seeing it with vaccines. The inequity in the distribution of vaccines continues to be extremely serious and concerning, especially with the onset of new variants like the Delta variant, which are in very transmissible. We've seen now for the last three to four weeks an increase in cases of COVID across the world in five out of the six WHO regions. And unfortunately, over the last two weeks, increasing deaths from COVID, particularly in Africa. We've also got data from uh, HIV-infected people in the, in the WHO clinical data platform that many countries are collaborating on that show that people with HIV have worse outcomes, both in terms of more severe disease, the need for hospitalization, critical care, and mortality. So it's really important that people with HIV are prioritized in country uh, vaccination programs to receive uh, the vaccines as soon as they are available. But there is, there is also good news. I mean, a record 27 million people are now on antiretroviral treatment worldwide. We've seen innovative community-led service delivery solutions. 
uh, while many countries were in lockdown, we, we saw countries in adopting these methods of, of delivering treatments, uh, of using digital technologies for follow-up, of giving multi-month uh, treatments uh, to patients with TB, with HIV. And we did see uh, stockouts as well of drugs in many countries, but countries were able to adapt. Supply chains were uh, uh, handled so that they were, they were not disruptions for too long. But really, it's ultimately, I think, the community-led and community-based responses that in COVID as well, we've seen in countries which have had strong primary health care systems, which have invested not just on the delivery side of health care services, but also on the demand side, where communities are involved and engaged, where community health workers play an important role. These are the countries that have managed to keep COVID under check even before the advent of vaccines. Now, you also talked about political leadership, and this is, this is critical, where in countries after country, we've seen where there's been a strong science-based, evidence-based, data-led response to the pandemic, where data is encouraged to be collected, disseminated, and is, is used very transparently to inform the public, those are the countries that have done well in terms of a, of a response. We also know now that there is a new proposed global 95-95-95 target set by UNAIDS. We will need to redouble our efforts to avoid increasing infections, to avoid service disruptions, so that people who are on antiretroviral treatment can continue to get their medications and, not, and, and make sure that we don't take the focus away from diseases like HIV, like TB, that still kill millions every year, even while we focus on the COVID response, on scaling up COVID vaccinations. We need to keep the spotlight and we need to ensure that political leaders will invest in health, will invest in health workforce, invest in health systems, and particularly on strengthening the primary health care response. One quick second question. The WHO has recommended governments to spend 0.1% uh, of their GDP, of their gross domestic product, on development assistance for health. Simply put, why does the health of people in lower and middle income countries also matter to people living in high income countries? I think the pandemic has demonstrated to all of us how interconnected we are and how we're all one people really living on this planet. We cannot exist in islands, when you, especially when you talk about pathogens, bacteria, viruses. They are not limited by national borders. They don't listen to you know, the rules made by countries. They spread where they get a chance. And we've seen how trade was affected, how the global economy has suffered. And in fact, there have been many calculations by eminent economists, the IMF as well, uh, predicting that unless the developing world, the lower middle income countries and the low income countries also come back, that, that those populations are vaccinated, that those economies start um, recovering, because they are the ones which actually consume. And it's, it's those economies that power, in, in a large part, the global economy. And therefore, it's a fallacy to think that high-income countries can vaccinate their populations and that the world will be back to normal, while half or more than half the world is, you know, is, is still struggling. I think we've, the, the links between health and economy and the fact that we're all one connected world are very clear and should be enough of the, to make a case for political leaders, particularly in the high income countries, to ensure that, that not just the 0.1% of ODA, but the $50 billion that are needed immediately to, to ensure that vaccines and drugs and diagnostics can be made available to people across the world. That's, that's the urgent priority just now. Thank you very much. Over to Minister Jens Spahn. He's the German politician of the Christian Democratic Union of the CDU. He has been serving as federal minister of health in the fourth cabinet of Chancellor Angela Merkel since 2018. And he is here to speak about the importance of a cooperation in responding to global health challenges and the need to adapt and enhance the innovations emerging from COVID-19 and the HIV response. Minister Spahn, one important lesson we have learned is the need for a multilateral and inclusive response to global health challenges. In your view, why is this so important? 
Well, thank you, Eckhart, first of all, because the German government really believes in multilateral uh, cooperation. I want to welcome you all, at least virtually in Berlin. We are very proud, uh, actually, to have the International Ice Conference in Berlin this year. We would have to love that under uh, different circumstances, but nevertheless, this is, it is good to have that exchange now uh, on this way. And somewhere soon, hopefully, we can... Uh, welcome you all uh, here in Berlin. Uh, multilateral cooperation. Actually, from HIV, we have learned uh, that multilateral response that includes uh, the people and communities affected, uh, that's the way actually uh, to get through it. And UNAIDS was a, um, a truly multi sectoral and still is multi sectoral answer, multilateral answer to the HIV AIDS threat to the world, uh, and actually shows and has shown to the world uh, that it can work to work together in an organization uh, to fight a disease. And actually what we have learned from this approach, this multilateral approach added by others, by the way, tuberculosis was mentioned is something we can take now for the fight against COVID-19. But before that, what we have learned from the HIV AIDS um, uh, situation worldwide too is the uni that universal health coverage actually is, is the key. It seems to be self-evident that primary health care uh, actually makes a difference in, with, for all those diseases and fighting them. Uh, but obviously, we are not yet there where we need to be. And that is why Germany, Ghana and Norway, for example, within the United Nations actually have asked for the Global Action Plan for Healthy uh, Lives. Because what we do see, uh, one thing is to have a drug or a vaccine, but you still need to be able to really deliver it, to administer it in all countries uh, to all people. And for that, you need a working healthcare system. So uh, besides the multilateral cooperation on certain diseases, what we need as well and what we are engaged in is to uh, build up a primary healthcare system in every country. Regarding COVID-19, uh, one has to say the world come, came together very quickly uh, at the end of April 2020. Uh, to speed up the response. Uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. That's actually uh, the motto uh, of the engagement. And that is what I tell our German people. It's a humanitarian help, yes, but it is in our own national interest to vaccine the world because what we see are variations of concern uh, occurring uh, everywhere possibly. Uh, and I accept that people say, yes, there is not yet equitable access to vaccines uh, for COVID-19, but still it will be there within months, not within years. Uh, and that's the difference uh, to, to other diseases we have seen. I was in Congo in uh, November 2019 to see the Ebola situation. Meanwhile, we have a vaccine, but sometimes I wonder if we had had uh, a vaccine much quicker if Ebola had occurred in the Western world. So actually what we do see, if we put forces together and really want to make a difference, science, uh, public life, governments, uh, uh, and everyone engaged, uh, we can, and that is what uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic actually shows us. There will be a vaccine available for the whole world, for everyone on the world within months. Uh, and we don't have seen that before. That is why we have, that is why we have built up the ACTA. Uh, uh, and that is actually how we have shown that the multilateral response makes a difference. We have learned that from HIV. It has taken a while till it was possible to have that multilateral answer on HIV. And I would say this time we have been quicker. It was not yet perfect. It needs to be better next time, but it was better than before. Yvette, would you like to comment on what you've just heard from the three other panelists? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to say we, we, we need to act early. There's no time to lose. I think advocates saw with the announcement early, early in February and January that we are going into a pan pandemic. And it, governments, our leaderships, our policymakers did not act early. Leadership is also needed at all levels and action in community and information must be available in real time for local responses and for our communities to be able to act 
embrace the science and the in innovation while human rights are protected. I think one of the biggest, biggest issues that affected many communities, many countries, were the lockdowns and also the criminalization thereof. You cannot lock down people and still expect them to be under a criminal act as if they have done something wrong. It, I, felt, I feel that what we are missing from the panelists is how these affected, these real issues in our communities uh, affected us. And advocates and scientists must speak through to power. Now is the time we have to speak through to power. We did not act how we should have acted. And I think we should just start planning for the next pandemic today. In this meeting right now, in this recording, all of us should have in mind that the next pandemic might be tomorrow. My granny used to tell me the best time to plant a tree is today. Well, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago because uh, the, the, this pandemic was one with, uh, that has been announced many times. And uh, uh, Mr. Fauci, do you think we are better prepared now for the next pandemic, the next zoonosis, because the risk of uh, viruses swapping over from the animal ki uh, kingdom to the human uh, beings is uh, increasing worldwide. That's what I could say, that this is uh, really not the last zoonosis to uh, be tackling human beings. I think in some respects we are better prepared, but in others we are not. Uh, when you think, at least when I think in terms of preparedness and response for an emerging outbreak, there's the public health response and there's the scientific response. If you look at the history of what has happened over the last year and a half with COVID-19, the public health response from country to country has really been somewhat fragmented. Certainly in my own country, the United States, it is not something that you would say was a resounding success story. We have a large country. Uh, we have a relatively small proportion of the population of the world, and we already have 600,000 deaths in our country. So from a public health standpoint, I don't think that you could say it was successful. It was characterized by a rather substantial and disturbing degree of divisiveness in our own country when there was a politicization uh, of how one approaches an outbreak. And I think if there's a lesson learned, certainly in the United States, is that when you are dealing with a pandemic that involves everyone and anyone, the common enemy is the virus. The common enemy isn't the people that you have disagreements. And it calls not only for an individual country, but for the entire world to pull together in a synergistic way to address a global pandemic, because a global pandemic requires a global response, not just an individual country response. Fortunately for us, the one success story has been the development of extraordinarily effective and safe vaccines. That has been something that's been unprecedented in the speed and in the success with which that's happened. The challenge now is something that's as important as the accomplishment of the science. And that is to get equitable distribution of vaccines throughout the world so that people don't suffer and die merely on the basis of where they happen to live, where they happen to be born. So we really have an obligation, and I think it's a moral obligation for the rich countries of the world to make sure in real time now that we get vaccines to the lower and middle income countries that don't have the capability of getting it, because these vaccines absolutely are life-saving vaccines. So I'll stop there for a moment. Thank you. Um, over to um, WHO, to Dr. Swami Nathan. Yvette mentioned uh, HIV denialism. And in the COVID-19 response, we uh, saw that not everybody was happy having a vaccine. Uh, in Germany, but all over the world, uh, did we underestimate the vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 global burden of diseases you pointed out already and, um, years ago? Did we underestimate the 
amount of communication we have to do because one of the IAS uh, mottos is follow the science, but not everyone is following right through. Yes, I think you raised several important issues. The first one, I think, is the importance of trust. And again, it goes back to involving communities and involving particularly those who've been traditionally marginalized uh, and stigmatized, perhaps. I mean, you, we've seen the stigma as well in COVID uh, towards people infected in many communities, just like we saw for HIV AIDS and we've seen for TB. So we've also seen that in countries where people generally have a higher trust in government, in public health authorities, that there is more acceptance of the public health and social measures and more acceptance of vaccination as well. So I think trust, transparency, and communication are extremely important, whether we're dealing with COVID or we're dealing with other big public health challenges. And we've seen also that the data that has been available in many countries is far from what we would like. And so I think, again, it brings out the importance of investing in data systems and particularly in mortality and cause of death statistics to really understand what the burden of disease is. The second point is, I think it's become very clear that because of the huge proliferation of, I think, social media and all of these different communication channels that we have today that we did not have in the past, that we have something that, you know, WHO described as an infodemic. So along with the pandemic, we had this huge explosion of information that's available to people. And a lot of it is, is false and misleading or purposely, you know, put out there as disinformation, creating, you know, conspiracy theories, anti-science people. And there are so many things circulating on social media that people get very confused because sometimes they quote people who are you know, respected scientists, something is taken out of context, uh, a video is created and circulated. Uh, and this has really been a challenge for us. So actually, we've created a whole new field of work. And this is this has to be an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary effort, because it's not only for the scientists who are working on vaccines to explain this, but you need people with a social science, behavioral science background, you need anthropologists, you need NGOs and people who've been in the community and you need respected voices, you know, whether they are religious leaders or community leaders or, uh, or musicians and film stars to, to convey the right messages to people. Uh, and, and then, of course, we have to be open to a communication and, and answer people's doubts and queries. Many people are not vaccine hesitant, but they have some genuine questions and queries which really need to be addressed. And again, I think it relates to, to having to belonging sometimes to a community that's been traditionally marginalized or neglected or, and, and perhaps have had unpleasant experiences in the past. Uh, and then finally, I would say that uh, we need to learn, I think, that this pandemic has exposed the inequities and inequalities in society uh, and the countries and the populations that have suffered the most and will continue to suffer are going to be those who have already been living on the edge the people who are informal workers have lost livelihoods, children are out of school, do not have access to online education. So as we countries rebuild and think about the future, I think our first priority must be to protect those people who do not have the social protection that they, they need, whether it's health or education, and uh, because otherwise we will never have uh, a society that's completely healthy and, uh, and, and economies that are, that are doing well for that matter. Thank you. You mentioned the, the power, the negative, destructive power of social media. I want to give a positive example. Most Germans have the Corona Warn app uh, on their smartphone. Uh, Jens Spahn, over to you. What, what role has digitalization in getting the right communication across? Well, it obviously plays a big role, actually, to collect the data and at the same time to engage with other countries. I mean, we have managed, and it has taken some time with 27 member states of the European Union to at least have a common approach when it comes to a digital certificate for vaccination and testing. Uh, and that, of course, is actually a good base to develop a worldwide system. Uh, because if you want to, to travel, if you want to move mobility all over, 
uh, we need to make it uh, possible. And for this, the systems need to be interlinked. But I already realized how difficult it is to get a transatlantic linkage uh, on this already, uh, and uh, that it is for the world. Uh, too, but still, uh, that's that's a chance uh, we have. Um, uh, if I might add something, it's the same with with information. It was just uh, mentioned. I mean, we 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 have our experiences from the HIV campaigns, and what kind of positive, motivating uh, narratives do function, and which do not. Uh, the difference to HIV, uh, at, at least in the 80s, is now we have uh, uh, social media. Uh, to engage with in a positive way, and at the same time, uh, the fall of fake news and all the uh, false news uh, are, are spreading around us uh, as well. Uh, so actually, that's for all of us. And the WHO has, has just mentioned it again, how they said this vaccination hesitancy is an issue. All of us have a, have a, a work to do here, actually, to convince people. Uh, if I just might add something to what Ivet uh, said uh, regarding, uh, again, I accept the critics. Um, but again, from the very beginning, the European Union has exported 50% of all vaccination or vaccines produced in the European Union. And I'm happy that the UK and the US will start to export now too. Um, but at the same time, um, we have to see that never before in such a quick, short time, I know it's about the upcoming months, but there will be a supply to all countries on the world, financed through ACTA. Uh, we already are building up capacities for billions of mRNA doses of vector-based uh, uh, vaccines. So as of today, I accept the critics, but at the same time, I'd say, give it some months and we will see for the first time in the history of the world that there was a common worldwide answer that made a difference for all people on the world that they can have access to a vaccine that is available in a speed that has never been seen before. I accept quicker is better, but at the same time, it was never quicker than it will be now. Um, Yvette, over to you. How can digital solutions contribute or do they leave a, a even bigger gap? What do you think? And how do you respond to Mr. Spahn? Uh, very important that we, we are, I am speaking from a third world country, and very so, soon after the lockdowns that we realized that COVID was going to be here to stay. We had to adhere to social distancing, strict lockdowns. We are a community of uh, peer education, sitting together, mobilization, where we all had to be in one space. But we realized that's not going to happen, and we had to jump onto these digital platforms to convene meetings, conferences, order food, book appointments, and even news updates to receive medical results. One of the biggest things that we currently have is for in South Africa for you to be uh, uh, to register for a COVID vaccine, you have to do it digitally. It has the burden of access of the internet, access of the the world that we are facing that is going to be a problem in countries like South Africa. Many are going to be left behind and left out because they do not know how to use social media correctly. However, access to the internet is hindering and the advancement of uh, is hindering the advancement of these tools. But as activists, we know how to fight. We know how to fight to ensure nobody is left behind. But we also are at also like to appreciate the work and the commitment by uh, by the previous speaker that we are going to have to move quicker and faster to ensure that third world countries are not left behind and you cannot say you are developed when your humanity is not developed. You know, humanity has to remember that other countries do not have access to vaccines and that without them you are not a developed country or a developed world. Mr. Fauci, what are you thinking about what Yvette just said? No, I agree with her completely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the lessons that we've learned from HIV, um, and uh, I think one of the ways to, to apply that, and a good example of that, has been the PEPFAR program and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. You know, we had spectacular therapies that were life-saving with HIV, where you could essentially turn someone around from what had been an otherwise inevitable death sentence to being able to lead 
a healthy, productive life the way we see Yvette leaving, re- leading right now. But that would not have happened had it not been for programs such as the PEPFAR program and the Global Fund. I think those examples absolutely need to be used uh, for vaccines, certainly, uh, for COVID-19. And as the minister said, that is happening at a record speed. And I would hope that within a relatively short period of time, we do get total equity. I mean, from a logistic standpoint, it's going to be a bit difficult, but I think it's going at a good pace. But for future outbreaks, you asked one of the questions that of all of us is about preparation for the next pandemic. We will have another pandemic. It may not necessarily be in our lifetimes to the to the extent and depth and breadth of it that has been with COVID-19, but history has told us that we've always had, we have now, and we will continue. And I think one of the important lessons learned is the issue of global equity, uh, of opportunity to have the kinds of interventions that are life-saving, that we have a system in the world where they can rapidly be distributed to people without having people having to wait to the point where many, many more lives are lost than have to be. You can um, develop a vaccine against viruses, but you cannot vaccinate against heat. We actually have another global crisis, the the climate change, and it's uh, associated with the rising importance of zoonosis and other um, dangers for public health, like the climate countdown puts out. Um, uh, Over to the WHO, how do you deal with uh, the capacity of people uh, being overwhelmed by information of how, ma- how, how many crises can we uh, um, put up? Yes, in fact, you mentioned climate change, and I think that crisis is going to last longer and is going to continue to impact people possibly in a much bigger way than COVID. Hopefully, we will be over the COVID pandemic with uh, increasing vaccine coverage over the next few months, or at least the acute phase of the pandemic, even if we haven't gotten rid of the virus completely. But climate change isn't going anywhere. And again, it's one of those threats. And I would mention antimicrobial resistance as another one, which is a global threat, which affects everybody, uh, which again uh, does expose inequities, because the people who are going to suffer the most from climate change are not the ones who've actually contributed uh, to the increase in greenhouse gases. And so we need, again, global solidarity and uh, collaboration. This is something we've used these words over and over again from the beginning of the pandemic. I think the Director General has talked about solidarity in each one of his press conferences. But without solidarity, without global collaboration, cooperation, and agreeing to work in certain ways um, where everybody has to bear part of the burden of solving that problem. But again, in the case of climate change, I think we we know the facts are that high-income countries contributed much more to get to where they are now to climate change. So everyone has to be part of the solution here. But we need to sit and talk and find solutions. And one other point I'd like to make about research and development, we've seen the tremendous power of science and how that served us so well. And Dr. Fauci spoke eloquently about the investments that were made in vaccine platforms that resulted in this tremendous achievement of vaccines, you know, within 11 months of the start of the pandemic. And, as, you know, we it's, it's still a very amazing fact. But I think we need to think about access going along with R&D. Sometimes we focus on the science. Of course, it's important. We focus on, on getting the tools developed. But right from the beginning, I think we need to think about Okay, if we have that tool, how is it going to reach everyone who needs it? You know, whether it's a diagnostic for, for uh, you know, onchocerciasis uh, or filariasis, or whether it's a, a, a new vaccine for HPV, for example, for young women who still don't have access to it. We need to start thinking about these issues from the beginning, and the investments in R&D really need to be linked to access provisions. And private sector plays a very important role in all of this in delivering the tools. But I think the public sector, governments that invest in these in these things must think about access as well. We all agree that uh, we should follow the science, but over to Yvette, how do we uh, manage that HIV is not a forgotten pandemic in this case? 
Yes, uh, thank you so much. And I, I, I would, it would be an injustice for me to, to not mention that we've lost so many family members, friends, leaders globally. And I would like to remember some of them, Dr. Fansail, Ref Pumzile uh, Mabizela, and Dr. Gita Remdi, and many others. And how we not, do not forget is putting faces to their names putting faces to the statistics, remembering that the people we have lost is not just 1%. It's 1% of somebody who is special to somebody out there. And that is how we not don't forget. That is how I am 20 years in fighting for HIV equity and equality and making sure human rights are never forgotten. It's because I know people personally. And I think if we all do that, Globally, we will remember that these are not just statistics, but human beings. We've been uh, mentioning many global crises, but uh, to wrap up this talk, I would um, like to have a, some note of optimism and maybe a lighter note. Mr. Spahn, you've been at the center of this pandemic uh, for one and a half years now. Is, was there an absurd moment that you remember? Was there something where you thought, well, is this real? Um, so actually, I'm not sure if it is optimistic. Um, because you mentioned the vaccination against heat, I would say there's none against hate either or fear. And that is a bit similar. Of course, both diseases have, uh, you, you can't really compare them. There are differences, but there are some similarities. And you know, the, the outrage demonstrations I've seen against uh, our COVID measures, uh, uh, the fears and blunt aggression in people's eyes spitting on me, uh, actually that reminded me that liberal democracy is actually about having a good sober debate in which you presume the other persons might be right too. Uh, and uh, if we learn something from all of this, I, I really do hope that um, uh, actually the way we discuss and that actually that we are able step by step to get out of this pandemic situation with the vaccine, with what we have learned about the disease and how we can prevent each other, uh, that this gives us a more optimistic view and way into the 20s. Uh, and uh, that we actually leave all these uh, hate and false information uh, and uh, the national uh, uh, view that many had actually behind us and really uh, can make a difference from the future learning but we, by what we did wrong, but learning at the same way by where we were actually pretty good. I mean, that we are here in the first time of of the mankind having a vaccine within a pandemic situation that has never happened before actually should give us some optimism too for the future. And uh, the last word uh, is, uh, of course, to Mr. Fauci. You've been serving seven presidents in the United States. Um, they were very different, to put it lightly. And uh, do you remember a moment where you wanted to, to just put down this job in the last presidency? You've been uh, uh, called a skunk at the picnic, jokingly. Well, is there a, a light anecdote to end this? Um, how much have you been suffering during the last four years? No, I don't think it's all part of my job. I don't take it as, as being suffering. But I think the uh, very accurate thing that, that you said, Eckhart, is that the Everyone is different. You know, the presidencies are defined by the individual and by the circumstances under which their presidency exists. So I've had the opportunity to serve on the seven presidents, and they had different challenges throughout. The thing that I'm very optimistic about right now is that President Biden clearly makes it very clear that his mantra is really one of the, you know, one of the themes of what we all feel strongly about is to, and that is of IAS, is to follow the science. And that's really what he feels very strongly about. So I was very gratifying from the very first day of his presidency. He told me that no matter what, we're going to follow the science. We may not be right all the time, but if we're not, we're going to correct it and we're going to go in the right direction. So I hope that's going to be a pathway to really getting our arms around this and ending this terrible pandemic. We have, we're a very interesting generation, all five of us. We've lived through two of the most extraordinary pandemics in the history of civilization, HIV and COVID-19. 
It's extraordinary, but that is a historical fact that we have lived through two extraordinary pandemics. And hopefully the lessons that we have learned from this will prepare us and the world for what we might see in the future. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, as I may say, you're one of the personal heroes of putting science first. And uh, thank you very much to all the participants of this uh, starting panel, which was really fascinating. We all agreed that we have to work harder to get the vaccination uh, accessible globally. Of COVID-19 is a tipping point for global health. It can be an opportunity for improvement, innovation, and investment in global health systems. Or it can be a risk of a colossal scale if these lessons are not learned and acted on for the future. Just as 40 years of HIV experience informed the COVID-19 response, the scientific breakthroughs and political will achieved by COVID-19 must now propel the HIV response. We have the opportunity to adapt and enhance the approaches from the COVID-19 response to HIV and sustain political attention on public health. Thank you very much for joining us for this discussion, and we will see each other again at 1 p.m. for the first prime session titled Emerging and Re-Emerging STIs in the Genomic Era with Professor Deborah Williamson. <laughs>